Great. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who is joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to talk about investing in systems capacity, and we're looking forward to a dynamic and interactive conversation. Uh, my name is Marie Haneaz. I use she, her pronouns, uh, and I am with Grantmakers for Effective Organizations. I'm also joining you from Washington, D.C., which is the land of the Piscataway and Nakamshtunk people. Uh, and welcoming everyone else who is getting checked in over the chat. So seeing a lot of familiar faces, great to see you um, and meeting some folks, I think, for the first time. So just in terms of a little bit of context around today, it was so lovely uh, kind of getting connected to Marissa and Susan around their original concept for today's call and kind of thinking through what would the value be to bring this to our GEO community and what would serve both the purpose of um, kind of the original work that they had put together in their recent article and then how we could kind of uh, support funders and both understand some of those practices, but also being able to move towards action. Um, so why does GEO care about this? GEO is committed to advancing racial equity, which is uh, truly systems change work at its heart. And we are eager to engage in conversations about what it takes to advance and sustain systemic change. Uh, GEO's new strategic direction, uh, which I think some of you may have seen by now, uh, it has four core pillars, uh, really four core goal areas, and they are centered around culture, practice, learning, and community. And this is key uh, around the pillar and goal of practice, because there is a belief that grant making should center community, invest in capacity building, and provide long-term flexible and reliable funding support. Um, so the approach that Susan and Marissa proposed in their piece aligns so well with what we encourage grant makers to be doing in, their, in the field in uh, practice with community. And so I am really excited for you all to meet Susan, Marissa, and also Judy, who's gonna be a really a spotlight conversation here today. So welcome and um, Marissa, Susan, Judy, please join us. Thanks, Maria. Um, my name is Susan Misra. I am the founder of Aurora Commons. Our mission is to lift up worldviews that hold and see all life, human and non-human, as one interdependent whole system. And we see that as essential to really countering supremacy and advancing liberation. And um, I'm really excited to be here because, you know, 10 years ago, Packard, uh, myself, and um, Geo partnered on what it meant to do systems grant making. And actually, some of the people on this call are from organizations, from foundations that actually participated in our learning community 10 years ago, like Vitalist. Very exciting to see you all here. Um, and, uh, and now we're 10 years later and talking about like, what have we learned from um, actually investing in systems and it really does align, as Maria was saying, with some of the practices that GEO has committed to in its strategic direction around centering racial equity. So we're really excited to get into it today. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Marissa to introduce herself. Thanks, Susan. Hi, everyone. I'm Marissa Guerrero. I'm a program officer on the Civil Society and Leadership Team at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, at the foundation, I lead work investing in the strength of the foundation's Just Societies grantees, as well as the ecosystems in which they work. And I also oversee learning and evaluation for our team, which is how Susan and I got uh, connected into this conversation together. And I'll hand it over to Judy. Hi, hey everybody. Um, my name is Judy Wright. Pronouns are she, her. I'm the director of state programs for the Collaborative for Gender and Reproductive Equity. Um, we are a pooled fund that works at the intersection of gender, reproductive, and racial equity, and um, supporting folks working towards um, a society with economic opportunity, bodily autonomy, racial justice, and a representative democracy. And um, across all our program areas, we have a commitment to center communities that are most directly impacted by gender inequity in our grant making and um, using a power building lens in that work for long-term long, long system change. So very excited 
to be a part of this um, conversation and the broader community committed to do this type of work. Thanks for including me today. Thank you, Judy. So we're gonna start with the conversation between me and Susan about some of the findings um, of the of our research and uh, why they think why we think they matter. But I want to preface that with just talking a little bit about how this article came to be. Um, <clears throat> civil society and leadership was embarking on a new strategy, and we were looking for evidence of the relationship between capacity strengthening and system level change. And we'd operated with the assumption that there was a relationship, and we'd seen evidence again and again. But it still felt like a case we had to make and that capacity investments have an impact beyond individual leaders and organizations. And I'm sure that many of you who joined us today have experienced this pressure to show a causal link between investments in capacity and the achievement of outcomes. And we knew we couldn't prove that there was a connection, but we wanted to learn more about the relationship that does exist and how it looks across the field. So for all of the reasons Susan mentioned, including you know, her expertise in systems thinking, but also the past work we'd done together, uh, we reached out to Susan to do this research together. And she drew from her experience working with many philanthropic entities, as well as a review of relevant literature to gain some preliminary insights. But we realized we could learn the most from engaging directly with other funders who were also committed to systems change to understand what role investing in capacity played in their work. And we found a really interesting alignment of principles and practices that was notably consistent across a pretty diverse group of funders. And we, we realized that while it is close to impossible to maybe definitively answer the question of if investing in capacity necessarily leads to systems change, there was some really important nuance to share in terms of how capacity investments lead to systems change. And so in our article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, we elevated a few central practices that funders use to advance systems change by investing in capacity. And we hope this could be a resource for those who either want to invest more in the strength of actors in a system or who seek systems change, but have found it difficult to achieve and sustain. And indeed, one of our central arguments is that achieving systems level outcomes is possible without investing in capacity, but sustaining them is not. And so what does it take? We argue that to change systems in a meaningful way, funders need to invest in systems capacity. And looking across the field, there are three interrelated characteristics and practices, and it's really not limited to these three, but we found these three particularly compelling. First of all, they treat systems capacity as an outcome in itself. Secondly, they're both responsive and strategic. They don't see these as opposing approaches. And third, they have broad buy-in in their institutions that the strength of the system is essential to systems change. So we're gonna talk through each of these and along the way, I'll highlight how they show up in the Packard Foundation's approach and then I'll invite Susan to share reflections throughout as well. So starting with the first one, uh, treating systems capacity as an outcome in itself. We are all seeking to achieve outcomes that are massive in scale, whether it would be related to climate, democracy, gender equity, these are really ambitious long-term goals that are difficult to achieve and even more difficult to sustain. And funders are, you know, over the years have taken this longer view, but have also realized that they need to invest more holistically, not just in achieving outcomes, but in strong systems that can sustain these outcomes. So for example, our team, the Civil Society and Leadership Initiative, we're collaborating with other foundation initiatives in Indonesia, Chile, and East and West Africa to holistically invest in civil society, both through funding grantees, uh, leadership and organizational needs, but also by investing in infrastructure that supports these organizations, networks, movements, and others in the ecosystem, investing in uh, addressing threats to civic space and encouraging other donors to take a similar approach. And these initiatives that we're partnering with have programmatic aims related to forests, ocean conservation, reproductive health, and they've all built in outcomes into their strategies related to the strength of civil society. And they acknowledge that they can advance toward their programmatic aims without a strong system. And in fact, that a strong system is an end in itself. Our second point, uh, Funders who take this approach are both responsive and strategic. They don't see these as opposing approaches. When we have shared clarity about who will change the system, we can focus on making sure they have whatever they need to advance their work. 
There is a tendency in philanthropy to think about strategic approaches as narrowly focused, less flexible, more top down, and then responsive approaches as lacking in strategy completely. But funders can be strategic in a way that's flexible and responsive to grantee and field needs. So Packard's approach, for example, uh, we've long held a commitment to being both strategic and responsive. And our new strategy itself is a response to what partners told us was necessary to advance in, in systems change. Invest holistically in the whole system, focus on its strength, and attend to the environment in which they're working. And Susan, I, I would love to invite you at this moment to share any reflections on uh, what I've shared thus far. Yeah, um, thank you. So, I mean, I think that what I want to share is that this particular lesson about being responsive and strategic is very much tied to the first one about seeing um, systems capacity as an outcome. When I was having conversations with different funders, I simply asked the question like, what is the relationship between capacity and systems change? And how have, what have you learned? How has your learning about that evolved? And everybody had a different story about how they started by really listening to grantees and community members, right? And it was from that deep listening, whether it was to young people, you know, trans uh, women or other folks in the, the most impacted groups that they were able to really understand the challenges confronting them for systems change and what was holding people back. And they were also able to hear what the solutions were and the solutions that they heard from the people most impacted were what became the North Star or what became the outcome they were looking for, right? So like we talk about the California endowment, um, I happen to be looking at Han, uh, and like the, you know, it was because they were talking to young people that they started to center building power beyond service delivery. And it was when they started talking to power builders that they started to understand that the system itself needed to change to support people to co-govern, right? Um, and that's the type of re relationship between the first and the second principle that really is the intention of what we're trying to achieve in terms of equity and systems change. So, uh, and I, I can talk more about how the second one also connects to the third one, but maybe after you share about the third one. Thanks, Susan. So the, the third thing that we wanted to highlight is just the importance of buy-in. Uh, funders who take this approach have really broad buy-in in their institutions that the strength of the system is essential to systems change. And as you all know, um, if if you work in philanthropy or even if you interact with philanthropy, uh, a lot of the work of philanthropy is about achieving buy-in, like convincing others in your institution or convincing peer funders that an approach is the right way or it's worthy of investment. That's a big part of the job. And at Packard, it's been a long but successful journey to achieve buy-in in the importance of achieving of investing capacity as a part of a systems change approach. So over the past years, the role of our program has shifted, not even a decade ago, our grants and programs to support the strength of leaders, organizations, networks, and movements, they were always valued as meaningful investments, but were not viewed as integral to the foundation's understanding of how we achieve impact as they are now. Now the foundation has a cross-cutting commitment to the strength of civil society and a shared understanding that this is necessary for sustained progress on our interconnected foundation goals. And our leadership is supportive of this approach. And as I mentioned before, the initiatives that we partner most closely with have incorporated approaches and outcomes related to the strength of the system into their strategies. So investing in system capacity, it's not just the job of one person or the focus of you know one person or one team, it's really shared across the institution. Susan, I'd love to hear your reflections on this one as well. Well, so this one is very interesting because we happen to talk and 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 look at examples of many different types of philanthropic entities. So you had family foundations that had a couple of living donors as trustees. You had really large philanthropic institutions that had multiple departments and like a team of leaders. Um, you had tables that had multiple funders, all of which had different interest groups. Um, and buy-in, there were many different pathways to achieving buy-in. One of the key ones, tying back to the second principle about responsive and strategic, was putting people who were directly impacted in relationship 
with the people who are making decisions within the philanthropic entity, whatever that governing body was, so that they could really hear what um, what what made a difference to um, people on the ground. And um, that was a key part of buy-in. But the other thing that I took away from the conversations is like, people are super crafty. You know, <laughs> like you have to be very focused on like, how are we going to actually get people to come across and believe that capacity, the capacity of a system to change is really critical because it's a heady theoretical idea. Like it's hard to explain what systems capacity is, right? Um, and that meant that people had come up with different strategies to educate whole ranges of people throughout a foundation. And, but you know it when you see buy-in at the end of the day, because it becomes kind of um, a mantra or a self-indoctrinating principle. And you don't see a foundation or philanthropic entity having to fight for the belief that capacity matters, that systems capacity capacity matters. Everyone is, actually understands it. And they start to share stories about what the actual system might look like if it was functioning effectively, right? And so there's like that part of buy-in that we're really trying to get at when we're talking about it being embedded and embodied by the institution across staff, trustees, and different funding partners. I'll pass it back to you, Marissa. Thanks, Susan. I think you can actually um, bring Judy into the conversation. Let's chat about CGRE. Okay, great. That sounds good. Um, actually, could you switch to the next slide? Because I just want to, before we jump to Judy, just recognize the folks that um, participated in our research and conversations. Some of them are here on this call today and some will be watching on the YouTube channel later on. Um, but we wouldn't have gotten to these findings without their insights and actual experiences, as well as just grappling with what wasn't working, right? Like what they learned from what, what hadn't worked uh, to get to where we are now. So um, thank you all to participating in this. So now that we've talked about the three highlights, we're actually, we can probably take the, the shared screen down and I'd love to bring in Judy to talk a little bit about the specific experience at CGRE. And um, the Collaborative for Gender and Reproductive Equity is a great example of each of the three points. And um, based on input from you all before we got on this phone, like with um, different questions you were interested in, as well as questions that we pulled, we're just gonna do a quick interview with Judy to get her thoughts and insights about each of the lessons. Hello, Judy. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I think that the first question, people might be wondering, what is the Collaborative for Gender and Reproductive Equity? So could you just tell us a little bit about, like, what's the context? What is the fund? Sure, absolutely. As I mentioned in the intros, we're a pooled fund. So we have a set of donors that are committed to some shared um, values and strategies related at the intersection of gender reproductive and racial equity. Our fund was formed, uh, the conversation started in 2018 with a set of donors who were both um, aware of upcoming threats to abortion access and other gender and reproductive equity priorities and also wanted to take advantage of um, the opportunity to engage with new folks or donors that wanted to increase their giving um, at the intersection of gender and reproductive equity, in particular folks who were mobilized by the Me Too movement and the Women's March, who um, we had a hypothesis wanted to not just start funding in those areas, but really be part of a learning community to do it in a meaningful way. So that's the purpose that our fund seeks to serve both moving those resources um, to support organizations doing the work and also being a learning and connection space for donors um, who care about those issues. Um, and so across those, across all of our program areas, we have sort of a basic goal of advancing long-term power and stability for communities that are directly impacted by gender and reproductive inequity. Yeah. Um, what I love about CGRE is that you have very concrete, and one would say you need to have very direct policy wins 
um, in order to be successful, and yet you're still very committed to capacity. So could you also share a little bit specifically about what does it mean to shift capacity of a system, um, particularly a system as opposed to say other levels of an like organization, leader, field, et cetera, and, or even how you think of capacity of a system different from a policy win? Yeah, thank you. So I, in it, this pans out most, um, particularly I think in our state level grant making, um, where we really do have this focus on long-term systems change. And we recognize that that includes incremental concrete changes, things like policy changes or administrative changes. Um, and, um, you know, as I'm sure everyone on this call has experienced, you know, sort of the pattern where philanthropic investment often focuses on a particular policy outcome or an election cycle. And um, well, that kind of funding may deliver a short-term incremental win. You know, what we've seen, and, and Mar Marissa referenced this earlier too, is that it rarely delivers the kind of environment where it's possible to implement and sustain that win over the long term, and especially with an equity lens. And often feels transactional, rarely centers the folks that are really impacted by those policies. And so for that reason, CGRE really focuses on the system as a whole um, and trust that those incremental wins are part of that process and will come from this type of investment. So, you know, what we're really looking for is an environment where directly impacted communities have the power to influence decision making in a meaningful and long term way. And that what that's really advancing is a vibrant and representative ecosystem of folks doing the work that includes, in our case, for our issue areas, reproductive health rights and justice organizations, multi-issue organizations, democracy organizations that are utilizing a range of tactics and supported by a strong and stable movement infrastructure. And so I live in Ohio and it's growing season. And so the kind of metaphor that I've been um, playing with recently is, is this idea that, you know, a policy or, or electoral kind of centered funding approach often sort of plants a seed with the idea of growing a particular plant or flower. And that for us, our approach is we think of it really about nurturing the compost and that we believe that our role is support the cultivation of healthy soil. And that with that healthy soil, which in this case is strong organizations, dynamic leaders, stable infrastructure, that it's going to be possible to cultivate both those short-term meaningful wins and also really true long-term systems change. So, you know, in that context, we trust the movement leaders and the stakeholders in those communities to identify and advance the specific campaigns that are going to be viable. And we really focus on what our role is to help keep that soil kind of as healthy as it can be for those campaigns. Yeah, yeah. The I feel like there's a lot of words that we use. And like 10 years ago, when we started working on systems grant making, people were focused on individual interventions, organizational interventions, network interventions. You've used the term now of infrastructure. I think people are talk talking a lot more about infrastructure. And I'm wondering if you can talk about like, or give us an example of systems capacity. Um, yes. Sure. Yeah. And I think um, I, I saw the question in the chat too about sort of defining what we mean by systems capacity. So I'm going to take a little stab at it, but Susan, please jump in because it's this is it's yours to define. Um, but, you know, for us, the way we think of systems capacity is as opposed to one individual player or one individual approach that there is kind of a holistic environment where there are a, an ecosystem, if you will, a set of players that all are individually effective and also collectively effective um and then um and that that also has to take into account sort of the environmental factors as well so when you're traditionally i think thinking of capacity strengthening it's like you know this organization wants to work on board development and so we'll fund that or this leader wants to you know work on x and that for us when we think about systems capacity it involves those individual pieces but it is also the broader context where we're talking about both the individual players, their collective work together and the broader environment within their, where they're operating. Does that, Susan, I don't know if you want to yeah. add to that. That's sort of my take on, on the kind of systems approach. Yeah. I mean, and I see that there are a lot of questions about this. So, and it, it was a struggle for me also to really pinpoint what it is. And I think it's like, all of these are parts of the elephant 
And when we're talking about the system's capacity, we're stepping back to say, oh, this is the whole elephant, right? Um, so we can't define systems capacity separate from the tail, which might be the individuals and the ears, which might be the organization, but we're talking about the wholeness of it, right? And what is really important about it being systems is that it is the capacity of the entire ecosystem of actors and their relationships to affect the change, right? And for some people, that might actually be a policy change. Like, for instance, policies that enable people to be enfranchised as voters and for people to run ballot initiatives and things like that. So there may be a suite of policy solutions that relate to systems capacity, but there also might be a relate uh, a suite of like network fe features that relate to systems capacity, like having relationships with in inside and outside players, right? Having spaces for visioning and dreaming and for strategizing. Those all might be part of a systems capacity too. Where I see you might you might also have some ideas here. I would just add, I would underscore everything Judy said. I think it's about the individual players, about the infrastructure and the larger ecosystem and the environment in which uh, they're all working. And I think in terms of thinking about a funding approach, there's a difference between investing in the capacity of one's grantees and kind of drawing the line there versus thinking about well, who are all of the actors of the ecosystem, regardless of if they're working on the particular issue area that we're focused on, who are necessary in order to advance change. So thinking about like state tables and the important role that they play in advocacy, even though their focus is beyond maybe a particular issue area that a foundation is investing in, investing in those state tables, because we know that that's sort of where change happens. Yeah. And Han, thank you so much for sharing the California endowment. Essentially, every funder that we talk to has a theory of capacities that they see as central. And I think the California endowment is a great example of like really tight, well-defined capacities that they're looking for across the California ecosystem, right? And CGRE also has a very similar document that is about the different states and what capacities are needed in each state. Um, I want to keep going so that because we could spend a lot of time just on point one. Um, can you share your story about what led you to believe that capacity was actually critical to systems level impact? Yeah, I mean, and some of it is unique to the timing of when our fund kind of came to be. So our fund they sort of started conversations, started forming the fund in 2018, but our first real strategy focused grant making was in April of 2020. And as everyone on this call will remember, that was a, a really tough time for folks with a global pandemic, racial justice uprisings, economic cr crises. And so here we are um, funding folks to do what's already incredibly challenging transformational work in an environment that is increasingly hostile and difficult. And then, you know, on top of that, coming soon on those heels for our issue area, the, the Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade. So I think for us, we recognized, you know, if we want to really see these changes, we need to be honest about the kind of environment that folks doing this work are operating in. And this is, you know, it's, it's relentless work. There's not a starting point and a finish line. It's ongoing. And they're doing this work often under incredible pressure. And so unlike like a singular campaign where you're like, here's the thing and here's our plan and here's the hopeful outcome and the timeline for us. When you're talking about long-term systems change, it's ongoing and it's constantly adapting to different environments. So for us, it felt like a given that if we were having the expectation of moving this work forward, we had to make sure that the folks that were leading this work had the kind of strength support and flexibility that they needed to be successful. And that when um, we talk about the kind of wins we wanna see, it's just not realistic to expect those wins if you don't have all the pieces in place in a strong and stable way to get to the win and certainly not to support and protect and expand on wins. And so for us from the beginning, we wanted to build in this type of support into our funding. Um, not dictating here's how 
you all could be better at what you do, or here's what you need to fix so much, but really trying to listen to folks like, what do you need to be successful in this work, whether it's as an individual, as an organization, or collectively within your coalitions and networks, and be responsive to those needs, even if they didn't have an immediate obvious place in kind of like the timeline and plan of a campaign. Um, yeah. And in particular, because so many of our grantees are BIPOC-led and centered organizations that historically have not had access to the kind of resources that allow them to take the time to do this type of work, we've really prioritized those organizations in, in, in our capacity strengthening um, programming. That's great. But I want to build off of that. I'm going to ask you a question that's not one that we've practiced before. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so we talked before this about participatory grant making. And a lot of funders are moving into spaces like trust-based philanthropy, decolonizing wealth, participatory grant making, where they're shifting their relationship between the funders and the grantees so that there's continual ability to have that listening and, and responsiveness. But what I think is interesting is CGRE isn't, isn't doing participatory grant making, right? So what I would love is what are your lessons about how can traditional funders be responsive and strategic? What are the mechanisms in place that can just weave into our traditional ways of doing funding? Yeah, I mean, I think there's incredible opportunity to innovate and test new things in philanthropy. And I would say our collaborative is um, trying to do really good work within like a relatively traditional model um, that I think can be adapted with uh, to do really meaningful work in this area as a strategy. If, if organizations aren't in a place to say like, we're gonna try something totally radical. Um, so I think that's exciting because it makes this kind of work accessible to funders who aren't in a position to kind of recreate or re-envision their grant making. So, I mean, a few things that we do is um, that, you know, is, is really ensure that all of our um, systems and processes are very low burden. Almost all of our grant making is multi-year general operating support. Um, on top of that, we layer in this intentional funding around the capacity strengthening. We also provide funding for coalitions and networks, and they don't have to be formal defined coalitions. It, you know, for example, there was a network of first time um, women of color executive directors in Texas that had been meeting informally. And they said, hey, you know, if we had some space to like talk and learn and support each other, that would really change how we're all operating within our own organizations. And so, you know, being able to support asks like that, that don't take kind of radical changes in the approach to grant making, but but are really rooted in, in trust, I think are um, really simple ways to move this kind of work forward. I think another mechanism for this that helps our listening and understanding is to offer conversations in lieu of written reports, um, phone calls, um, and um, regular check-ins that are aimed not to be around accountability, but really around us understanding what folks need. And we find that with those the combination of the trust-based kind of methodology, that those conversations don't feel staged, that they feel honest and we get more clear feedback from folks about what um, what kind of needs they have. And the other thing I would add is that we you know, don't have the internal capacity to run these kind of programs ourselves. And we partner very closely with the Leaders Trust and the Resilience Initiative to support a lot of the folks that we're funding. And so I think some of it is like, you don't have to recreate the wheel. Folks know how to do this really effectively and that where we are a steward of resources, other folks can be out there really um, supporting people in ways that center the needs and values of the organizations. Yeah, this is just making me pull out and think about how in some ways CGRE is, it's operating just like the, um, the systems change you want to see because you're not only giving the general operating funds so that people can be flexible in what they're doing and pursuing based on their own strategies, but you're building in flexibility to your own funding so that you can be responsive to needs that are emerging, right? And you're you're leaning into relationships and like building relationships between the grantees and you at the funders so that you can really understand what's going on and continually adjust to what they what you're hearing. Um, well, I do. I think I, I just want to lift that up because I love how 
we're breaking the wall between funder and grantees, even in um, traditional philanthropy, right? And what difference that makes. Do you have any thoughts about what, what it means to be intentional about power and like where you want to keep some good boundaries up to support the, the overall systems change? Yeah, I mean, we think about power in, in several different ways. And, and I want to acknowledge that no matter how much you try as a funder to use trust-based practices and to be authentic with your partners, we're never going to entirely break down the power dynamic between funders and um, field organizations. So just to acknowledge that, right, that power dynamic is real. I think part of the way we're able to break that down, though, in um, in terms of thinking about power and systems change is because of this systems approach, because we're not saying what's your individual work and how's it gonna equal X. We're saying, what's your lane in this work? What do you need to be successful? What are the gaps in the system you're operating in? And are there ways we can support meeting those needs, whether it's for other organizations or the ecosystem as a whole? And really trying to be clear that, you know, for our vision of power, and that could be governing power, that could be people power, that could be narrative power. There's lots of different types of power that people are working towards is really rooted around having a system where the folks that are most directly impacted have the influence they need to drive decision-making. And so we're not approaching each grant as a what's the result of this grant or what's the outcome of this campaign, but a how are the environments where these folks are working different and what will that result for the interest we have around our specific policy focus, but also recognizing that that's also those environments are gonna result in the same kind of outcomes we wanna see, whether it's around climate or around education or around um, criminal justice reform. Yes. Like what you just said and how you said it, it totally embodies what we mean by investing in the capacity of the system um, to change the system and like how it's just a totally different mind shift and you have a different language around like what you're trying to strive for and who you're holding as the we, you know, beyond the grantees. I love that. I have time for only one more question. Um, so the question I'm going to ask is about buy-in. Because what's so fascinating about CGRE is that you had some initial funders who were already on board. Um, and so that that's one thing is like, how do you bring people in, right? Um, but you also have people who are changing, even if the same institution is at the table, staff change. So how do you keep the stories and the history and the legacy and the inspiration and the commitment to the capacity of the system? as the players actually change, even if the institutions stay the same? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's a, you know, it is similarly, it's a constant conversation, you know, keeping the drumbeat going, this is the way we do this, this is why it matters. And all of the ways that we present um, information to our table of donors and, and to acknowledge like we have, the Packard Foundation at our table that's, you know, tip of the spear on these kind of conversations. And we have others at our table that are really in a learning stance about this kind of approach. And so not everyone is in the same place, but I would say there's a few ways to sustain buy-in. One is it's not a separate thing. It's not like here's our programs and we also have this thing. It's that each of our approaches, this is an integrated part of it. Like this is part of our theory of change is that you need to have this kind of strength um, and invest in it directly for any of the things we want to do. So it is a core part of our programming. It's not an add on. And I think that when you come to the table and you understand, oh, this is how they do it is different than here's what we do. And here's something else that's kind of nice. Um, and so I think that's one way to sustain buy-in and as it's just sort of a structural way. And then I think also it's constantly lifting up the stories. I think one great example is, you know, we, Michigan is one of the states where we um, focus our funding in our state power building program. And, um, you know, in Michigan fund a set of individual organizations, fund some coalitions, fund some capacity strengthening to some of the BIPOC led and centered organizations playing key roles. And um, we were excited to see some of them in real leadership positions working to pass the reproductive uh, freedom ballot initiative in 2022 in Michigan. It was a huge historic win. And what we know is that that following that win, there's uh, legislative work to do, there's litigation, and there's making sure the things got traded off 
still get followed up on. So we're not saying we're just going to give up on those wins now that we pass the ballot initiative. It's an ongoing work. And so for us, it's being able to tell the story of that win that really satisfies funders that are like, what's the win? What's this for? But also making sure they understand, well, that win was far before CGRE's investment in the making of building the building the relationships and the capacity to get to the conditions where they could have that win. And also that if you don't sustain those relationships, if you don't sustain the leadership of the folks that are directly impacted, that that win is not going to stay permanent or meaningful or really reach the folks that it's intended to reach. So constantly lifting up, yes, that was exciting. And here's the next step. And here's why we stay after the win. And here's what folks are telling us they need to move the next piece of this work forward. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. The um... Any other thoughts that you want to add before we open up to questions? And folks, if you have questions, please do drop them in the chat. We do have a few minutes that we want to answer any questions. And it could be to Judy or Marissa or to me, or Han also is on the call. So we could bring bring Han in as well if she's willing. So nothing else specific for I'm happy to to defer to the group for it. For what we talk about. Okay. That's a welcoming, <clears throat> welcoming more questions in the chat. It was great, um, Susan and Judy, that you were able to take so many of them as we moved along. Uh, so yeah, welcoming more in the chat if folks are interested and in offering some directly to me. Um, I'm happy to take those as well. Um, so Han has offered another question here, Susan, what would it take for us to tell the causal pathway story <clears throat> that embraces, sorry, that embraces that complexity of systems change, for example, under what conditions? I think that's a really good question. I mean, we, I started the research looking at whether there was a causal pathway between systems capacity and um, systems change. And we couldn't find that um, because there are, for a couple of reasons, but the primary one is like, there's no counterfactual example, right? There's not a, there's not a controlled experiment where we can look and say, we, we, we applied capacity investments here and it didn't work, right? Um, or it did. So that was the biggest challenge to coming to a causal um, method. I think theoretically you could have funders that were interested in investing in something that, like that. But the reality is, is that even when we were doing the, the lit review, most funders have gotten to the idea of systems capacity as critical to sustaining systems change from a lot of experience, like experiential uh, knowledge of investing in things that did not result in change, right? So they had, and that experience is like 20 years of experience. It's not just one year of experience. It was like year after year, we tried this, we tried this solution, we tried that solution, we tried this solution. We weren't able to sustain the systems change, but then we started investing the capacity of the system, especially like re there's lots of stories of relational systems. Like how do you bring all the different players in a system together, right? And then you start to see change. And so I think that's why people have not been focused on the causal link anymore because the actual experience is so powerful that you stop needing that causal link. I would just add a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, I would echo Susan's point that I think the believers are uninterested in finding a, a causal link, right? Because we, we believe there's a connection. Uh, I recall um, during the research, early in the research process, um, you and Anna Aguilar, who was working on the research with you, uncovering some um, studies that did identify a causal link between very specific capacity interventions and very specific changes in organizations. Um, so for example, um, building, you know, a capacity around financial management and then seeing an outcome that was closely related to financial management. And that makes sense because um, you can keep the intervention consistent and you're looking for a very specific outcome. Han, you pointed to the complexity. I think there's so much complexity here 
that it would be very challenging to embark on the endeavor. And I don't know if it's the right question. Uh, I'm curious, I would love to hear your thoughts. I know you added a little bit into the chat, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I mean, um, that's a question I've been trying to answer for, you know, the past couple of decades, just in terms of how complex it is, because we have to, I, I appreciate you are talking about the experience, because it's through cycles of wins, but it's cycles of doing the work that you get, you build the capacity to coalitions, all of the things that you need, and we found that, you know, it really takes that ecosystem kind of um, uh, orientation in order to move huge structural change agendas, but I'm not giving up on the causal analysis because I think there are the anecdotal stories that will get you so far, but if you want a really good broad buy-in across the whole philanthropic sector, you need to continue to build evidence. And uh, of course, if you give a group resources, they're going to be able to move farther sometimes than those who don't. So, you know, I, I don't know what the counterfactual would be, but still, um, I'm not going to give up because I think it's really important to make the case to do this kind of work. And, you know, I put up kind of a quick theory of change around trust based relationships with um, systems capacity investment and then getting to long term systems transformation. I would add their people power as part of it. But, you know, like we need to kind of really unpack all the assumptions and hypotheses that underlie all of those because the biggest breakthrough for us was just really understanding that. Um, people power is an end in itself and it's so critical. And I think that's what you're saying in effect with the system's capacity as an outcome in itself. Yeah, exactly. So thank that's, you. I also just seeing you and talking to you reminds me of something that was really cool that came up in our interview, which is that, you know, TCE invested in systems capacity, people power, and some of the benefits accrued outside of the grantees. So that's when you know you're working on systems capacity, like when it actually supports the whole system, even if they aren't your grantees. And those were really great stories, not necessarily causal, but still they point to some evidence, some rationale for why invest in systems capacity. Mm -hmm. There's one question here in the chat. Should we answer? Oh, go ahead, Judy. Well, I was just going to jump in on this kind of causal question really quickly, which, you know, agree that there's not the, the counter evidence kind of piece, but I, I do think there's a couple examples to me that are, you know, not hard evidence. So we're still in the anecdotal world, but, but we do have seen what happens when you don't invest this way. You know, I live in Ohio, which has for decades been invested in very transactionally, largely around election cycles. And, and what we've seen is an infrastructure that grows and contracts and a lack of trust and an environment of competition and that's changing now in in recent years with some with some deeper investment but um but when you look at the conditions of what it looks like when you don't have an investment in um organizations leadership and networks beyond specific tactics you see that maybe you get a win maybe you don't but you definitely don't get those conditions to keep moving and keep growing and move things forward. And so I think we, that is to a certain degree, it's not a direct evidence, obviously, but to me, I think that's important. Whereas you look at sort of the opposite, like in a state like New Mexico, where folks really were investing really deeply in relationships and connections and in individual organizations and in their coordination and working towards the kind of environmental conditions where change became possible. And then you see when change becomes possible, like really amazing, progress. Um, and my kind of theory around that is it's because there was a system that was high functioning and, and deeply supported that could take advantage of that moment where change was possible. And so to me, that's the case to make, you know, for us, we invest in places like Texas and Georgia, where real progress is tough to see right now, and uh, unlikely, and it's really defensive work, but that that kind of deep investment in those networks and systems now, when those conditions change, will have those organizations poised to really move move forward with actual systems change, actual progress. Um, and if we ignore those places now, then even if there becomes an opportunity for change, you won't have the system poised to take advantage of it. Thank you all. And Han, thanks for that additional context and question. Um, I'd love to invite Christina. Uh, would you like to give some voice to your question? Uh, also, just did you read our notes? Because this was a question <laughs> that I also had. So. 
please would love to uh, hear your voice. No, I, I might have been the one that uh, asked the question already in the registration process, but uh, yeah, my my question just comes because I'm in the middle of actually trying to craft our proactive grant making and really making it proactive rather than just that, you know, additional reactive with some extra strategy. And uh, in reading the article, it was very timely, yet my question comes around, so how does the grant process then look like for you guys, right? Or for some of the examples that you saw, is it somewhere where uh, you set up the application that you want to receive and you say, hey, these are the things that we're going to be investing in. So these are the kinds of programs that we're inviting or the area of focus that we're still uh, trying to invest. Or is it more of a selective, we know who the partners are that are doing some of the work. We want to make sure that we uh, increase our capacity and make sure that they are they are having those, as you're saying, like the right environments and they're operating within those environments where it's going to make a change. Or is it something else? Thanks for the opportunity. I'm happy to take a stab and Marissa would love to hear how Packard approaches that too. Um, you know, within our, it's such an important question and gets to lots of questions around equity and access and everything as well. Um, you know, with within our program, we have sort of a universe of folks that we're funding with general operate multi-year general operating sort of support primarily. And as I mentioned before, we partnered with Leaders Trust and we didn't have the capacity to provide deep capacity strengthening resources to every one of those grantees. So I've kind of set up a, a set of criteria that felt meaningful to us um, around kind of their roles in the ecosystem, their leadership, whether they've had major organizational transformations um, in recent years, um, their size and scope um, to help identify kind of a subset of those grantees that we would offer an opt-in opportunity to participate in this. It was really important to us that this was all an offering that people could choose to take or not um, for those and, you know, provided lots of information and context of kind of what the expectations and commitment would be so that we weren't creating more burden for folks that didn't have the capacity or interest in taking that on. Um, and then once we had identified a set of organizations um, that were interested in doing this and had the kind of organizational capacity to take it on and wanted to opt into the process, then we layered on an additional two year, um, in this case for us, it was a $110,000 grant to those organizations. And they worked with Leaders Trust um, to build out a plan of what they wanted to address and how they wanted to address it, and then um, have coaching and accompaniment through those two years to do that work. That's at the organizational level. I mentioned sort of like the grants like for the BIPOC ED network. Those are more like folks come to us and say, we need X, can you support it? And trying to be as flexible and easy on saying yes to those kind of questions, trusting them to identify the gaps. So that's a more traditional grant making process and really, for us, the key is keeping the barriers as low as possible to access the resources and keeping the reporting burdens very low um, so that it feels like a value add and not like more work we're asking people to take on. I can add, um, because I, I appreciate that you're trying to figure out sort of like how you get the, how sort of grantees come to you. Um, so for the Packard Foundation, I would say that uh, the initiatives we work with use a combination of, of all of what you laid out, competitive grant making, identifying grantees and going, you know, and offering them support, doing some requests for proposals. Um, our team, which is focused on, you know, investing in the strength of our partners and the ecosystems in which they work. Uh, a lot of residents with what, with what Judy shared, like want to have sort of a menu of supports that grantees can opt into. And it's really important to us as well that when we are offering organizational strengthening support to individual organizations that um, it is not competitive. So we work really hard um, with initiatives to, you know, identify organizations that have pressing needs that are um, going to be priority grantees, you know, over a, a longer term and then we're able to go to them and say, we want to fund you. And we we just want to hear from you sort of what your priorities are. And so there is the, the release of pressure of feeling like you need to, you know, compete for a grant or write, you know, that you're writing a proposal in order to get access to funds. 
it's more of a partnership and collaboration that we're figuring out together what's going to be the most impactful for you. And then we're funding, you know, whatever, whatever that is. Um, in our other pathways related to supporting infrastructure and investing in civic space, uh, those we are thinking through more collaboratively, um, both by doing some research in our priority geographies that brings in a lot of voices from the field and helps us figure out what we should be prioritizing, and also by convening advisory groups who will help direct us in terms of organizations we should pay attention to, um, you know, how we like the levers that we should be focusing on related to civic space and then kind of following their lead in terms of who we support. Susan, I don't know if there's anything you want to add from um, set of interviews that you did. I think you all covered it. Um, I actually wanted to talk to Angela's question. What's the best way to move away from supporting programs and projects? when you're actively funding a grantees program. And it's very interesting because we didn't write about it in the article, but when we did the research, like most of the folks that we talked to had done some work with grantees to help them have a system thinking uh, mindset. So sometimes it took the case, it took the form of like a leadership development program that grantees were part of, where they were able to learn about systems, like what is complexity, how do you see your issues from a systems perspective. Other times it took the form of more of a convening where grantees were brought together and they started talking about the system that they saw. They were already in that language, so it was more about making sense of the system together and like figuring out what they wanted to do. Um, but pretty much everyone had some form of uh, work that was building systems capacity of the grantees themselves. Uh, and I don't know, Judy, if Mar uh, Marissa or Han, if you want to add to that. Well, actually, I will. I have just one thing to add that this gets back to the what Marissa said at the beginning of the call around, you know, the sort of false choice between strategic and responsive. And that, you know, our argument is that general support is the most strategic funding that you can give. You know, it, when you support a program, especially in the turbulent times that we're all living in, you know, a year into that program, sometimes it doesn't make any sense anymore. The conditions have changed. It's impossible. And so we actually feel like the it's not that general support is about being open-ended and just letting whatever happens happens. It's actually creating the strategic conditions for organizations to pivot. And that doesn't mean we don't care about programs or outcomes. It means that it's putting decisions in the hand of those grantee partners. So I think um, just to, when you're thinking about a reframe, it's when you provide general support, you're, the rationale for the folks that are really program centered on your boards or your teams, it's you're still supporting those programs, but you're also supporting them in a way that they can change and grow and adapt to their environment. So I feel like there's like a nice, it's a, it's a transition that doesn't have to be an either or, and you don't have to say that, you know, we don't care about strategy if we're being flexible in our funding. I think you actually would, I would argue that you, you care even more because you're making the strategy as nimble as it can be. Great. The, it would be great to hear from some of the folks that are on the call about how you've experienced some of the three lessons that we've learned, or even like what might be some of your challenges today that you're grappling with. Because when I looked at the list of people who are participating, I was like, these folks are already doing systems grant making, right? And like, we're, we're in it together. So if folks would be willing to share their own examples, that would be great. Anybody? Yes. How do you pronounce your name? Eusebio. You're talking to me. Eusebio? Eusebio. Eusebio. <laughs> Eusebio. Eusebio. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Um, Judy, what you were saying right now um, really resonated with me because that's kind of some of the things that we're, <clears throat> excuse me, 
that we're doing in terms of just you know reporting. So we've done away with all all reporting, um, which um, it forces us to do um, something different. And you know when we're looking at the impact we're trying to make, the impact we're seeking to make is systems level, is community wide, um, those types of impacts. And program reporting wasn't giving us that um, understanding of what impact we were having. So we did away with reporting um, and we're looking at, you know, what are some publicly sourced data points that we can glean for, um, for measuring impact. And the second part of that is we're convening our partners within a, um, in, in this particular case, civic engagement. Uh, cohort to help co-identify what um, what are the indicators that would be most meaningful that will tell us as a sector that that uh, that we're moving the needle so that we can then make adjustments uh, system wide on these efforts. So that's kind of what we're doing. That's a great example. Which foundation are you with? I'm sorry, with the Health Forward Foundation. We're in Kansas City. Excellent. And what's your learning edge question, like something that you would love to learn more about when you're thinking about the systems grant making? What would I like to learn more about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to learn. Um, I'd like to learn more about folks, um, you know, their struggles and where they failed or maybe like maybe not failed. I Because I, fails has a negative connotation, but I, I mean it in in a learning aspect, you know, what didn't work? What was, um, you know, what was something that that you learned that, uh, you know, others might not, um, might learn from and not make the same mistake? I've got a couple, so. <laughs> yeah. I might come back to you to ask you to share that. <laughs> Judy, Judy I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to share um, a challenge that we face. So, you know, we talk about, you um, Moving forward, the system change, and as I mentioned, you know, we fund in Texas, in um, Georgia, and um, so, and very focused on, among other priorities, abortion access is one of the things that we are hoping to advance and protect. And so we've been funding from 2020 to 2024 in Texas, and if one of our donors asks us, so so what's 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 different in Texas, it's that all the conditions are worse, absolutely. Like we cannot demonstrate any good conditions in terms of access to abortion, specifically in Texas, it has all been worse, right? And so how do you make the case that what we're doing matters when you're working in a state where not only are you not advancing change, but it's getting worse, conditions are getting worse. Um, and so that's where for us, the challenge is, you know, to your point, Eusebio, around like, what are the indicators we're looking at? You know, who are the, what are the roles of the folks um, in coalitions, are folks and other organizations that never cared about reproductive health rights and justice talking about it now? Who's at those tables? Um, who is working on growing the electorate so that we get to a condition where those changes can take place? And I feel like for us, it's really been a um, an important challenge to make the case for a strategy that we really believe is a winning strategy, if you will, in an environment where you can't demonstrate any of the wins that generally we as funders would rely on to show like, oh, this works, it's doing well. Um, things have been very hard and sometimes just holding your ground and staying staying functional as a, as a leader or an organization is, is, you know, the win in a case like that. And so um, for us, I don't know that, you know, I think the learning for that isn't so much like we would do things differently. It's learning how do we communicate about supporting work in an environment that doesn't deliver the way people are used to or want to hear and holding people's attention through that um, challenging time. I'll add another lesson um, somewhat related in terms of the, like the importance of sticking with actors. I think one major change that we've made in our approach um, from our last strategy to this strategy in terms of how we support partner organizations is focusing on being able to provide longer, deeper support, acknowledging um, that capacity work is ongoing work and 
uh, we've shifted from aiming to sort of provide, you know, a little bit of support to as many organizations as possible, you know, funding a project or part of a project um, to thinking about, okay, what's sort of like holistically what the, a smaller set of organizations need and how can we um, address, you know, support those needs over the longer term, as well as um, Judy, you referenced the Resilience Initiative, having some evergreen platforms that organizations always have access to so that when needs come up, there's someone there who can talk to you about an HR issue or help get, you know, a new executive director or coach. And so just thinking about the sort of the, the lesson I think is about how this is long-term and the commitment and supports also need to be long-term in order to really effectively support partners. Han, do you want to narrate the question that you put in the chat? Sure. Um, first, I just want to thank Judy. All of what you're saying is so resonant with our experience in our communities. So just you're lifting up so beautifully. Um, I just came from two days of uh, amazing conversations with the emergent learning community of uh, practitioners. And I think so much of what you're talking about goes so well with emergent strategy that there has to be that ability to quickly assess the environment and to be able to move quickly. And you can't do that unless you create, and funders create uh, conditions for experimentation and failing and trying many new things. So we're just curious if you have any examples of really good investment and in adaptive learning capacity building as a subset of systems capacity um, and um, any any stories around that. Um, a lot of what we do in the emergent learning communities rub stories together <laughs> so we can learn from each other. Yeah, it's such a great question. I We don't have like an explicit adaptive learning kind of lane. I know that, I think that's a been a part of what a lot of the convening um, has been of leadership, especially in the reproductive health rights and justice sector with such incredible changes in the last few years. Um, but it, it, I, I wish I had an a example, Marissa, maybe you do, of like a specific um, program targeting that. I think it's, for us, it's been more where folks are making space to build those skills and have those conversations either individually or collectively trying to support it. But we haven't actually had like an explicit, this is a, a sub strategy. Um, maybe we should, it's a great question. I mean, it's such an important skill set um, for leadership in any sector. I have a few thoughts. I do think um, thinking back to an evaluation that we did of our cohort programs, which really vary in terms of their, you know, the issue area focus of the people who participate, the geographies, et cetera. Um, we happened to evaluate them sort of at um, the moment of the pandemic, like we were looking sort of one year in with the acknowledgement that, you know, it wasn't necessarily going to be a representative baseline because of the moment we were in. But one thing that I thought was really interesting um, was that we found that cohort leadership programs are sort of the perfect vehicle for a moment of uncertainty because they are built to adapt to the needs of participants. And then participants also together can sort of build their capacity to, to be adaptive leaders. And so I think that that's, that's one approach that we've seen. Um, also, we don't have a sabbatical program, but we have funded sabbaticals or, or parts of sabbaticals. And I think just funding that space for thinking and reflection and creativity um, can lend, you know, the space for people to then be able to develop in terms of their adaptive capacity. Um, and this is more tactical. Um, and Judy, I imagine you've seen this as well. A lot of the organizations that we're working with are really deeply engaged right now in scenario planning that it's a moment where you need to be prepared to be highly adaptive because um, there's going to be sort of a, a fork in the road politically. Um, and a lot of the organizations we're working with are going to have to take very different approaches uh, depending on what happens in the election. I also wanna bring this back to the idea of systems capacity because like the, um, one of the things that I feel like I'm taking away from this conversation is, is that 
you know, you can make an intervention at the individual leader level, at the organization or a network level. Um, but if you're clear about what the capacity is that the system needs, then you can align what the system needs with the interventions you're making at the other levels, right? And in some ways, like having a partner like Leaders Trust or the Resilience Initiative or somebody else where you're outsourcing those pieces of capacity building frees up the funder to really think about what's happening at the systems level, right? Um, or at least that's something that I feel like I'm learning from this conversation. And I would say that those partners are able to have a bird's eye view, Res the Resilience Initiative Leaders Trust, because they're working with so many organizations across a range of um, issue areas. And so I think our relationship with them also informs how we're understanding the system. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Amidia, if anybody from Amidiar is here on this um, webinar, but they have a really interesting way of investing in adaptive learning. Um, it'd be great to hear from them if they're here, but, you know, Rob was one of the people that we interviewed and he has the spectrum that we shared in the article about complexity and like being really intentional about like, what are, where are you like in terms of your systems grant making intervention and if you're going to be working in the area of complexity which is where you would want to have adaptive and learning capacity right and then like if somebody if the funders choose to be in that space then actually equipping the funders with the capacity to think and operate with a system thinking mindset is really critical right? And to set goals or outcomes um, or results that you need that actually align with what are we learning about systems change versus some more tangible or, uh, you know, direct outputs. Um, and I think that comes into it as well. Okay. Any other examples? I'm noticing we're actually running out of time. I can't believe that. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, um, maybe we should go to our wrap up. Um, uh, it would be great to hear from each person, just like, what are you excited about um, like moving forward? Like, where do you wanna deepen in terms of really investing in systems capacity, right? What's that, what's that thing that's giving you juice for the next year? Judy, you want to go first? Um, I think for uh, for me, what's what's giving me juice is 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 probably um, seeing the um, the ways folks are coming together across historic issue spaces and different places and sort of multi issue perspectives, multi um, multi racial work. I think there's so much opportunity right now, in particular in states. Um, where people are really mobilized to think and plan together. And I think some of that is driven by some really real and scary threats, but it is exciting me to me to see those opportunities open up. And to me, that's where we're really gonna see real systems capacity advancements as people get outside their kind of standard um, spaces. And so really excited, you know, we're thinking through what does it look like to support configurations of people working um, across multiple states in similar ways and want to learn from each other? Or what does it look like to support folks um, doing cross-issue collaboration? And, and how do we put some resources into those spaces that get, that would complement some of the individual kind of organizational and more formal coalition work that we've supported? So that's exciting to me. I'm, I'm very curious where that will go. That's great. Thanks, Judy. Marissa? I think 
what's giving me juice is somewhat similar in the sense that um in the past five years of my work at the Packard Foundation, I've really been working closely with teams that have focused on specific issue areas. And now we are moving towards as a foundation, I think generally, um, working in a way that acknowledges the intersections across issues. And also with our strategy, it allows us to zoom out and look at the environment that people are working within and the infrastructure that is supporting sort of all civil society actors and not just our grantees. And I'm really excited. I mean, we're sort of on the precipice of starting to work deeply with advisors in our priority geographies. And I'm really excited to see what comes out of that mm -hmm. and how that shapes how we actually implement our strategy. That's very cool. For me, I think one thing that is really exciting about um, investing in systems capacity in the future is actually when it becomes the norm, right? Like now we, like 10 years ago, we were talking about how how do you even invest in systems, right? And now we have all this learning about investing in and supporting the capacity of a system to change. And some of those are lessons that are, you actually see patterns across multiple funders, like everyone is working on relationships among different actors, right? These types of things that keep coming up, learning and adaptive capacity, emergent strategy, there are these things that are, keep coming up. But what, what becomes possible when those become the norms and we're able to ask the next layer of questions? And for me, the next layer of question is about how do we not just change systems, but how do we transform and build new systems? Like, and what are the capacities needed for that? So I'm excited to continue to pursue that in the future. I'm going to pass it to Marita. All right. Um, well, uh, thank you so much. So Susan and Marissa, especially for your brilliance and partnership and really putting this together and bringing it to the community. Um, could not be more thankful to the both of you and Judy. Uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Just so much resonance in the chat uh, from the audience, from everyone else. And so really appreciate all that you've been able to bring into the room with your rich examples. Um, and then to everyone in the audience, thank you so much for being here, for being a part of the dialogue. Um, we thank you for joining us. And I believe uh, Marissa 